Hey everyone, good afternoon, good morning, good day, wherever the heck you are, whatever you're doing, I'm so glad you're here. So hey, do leaders need to be hospitable? I think so. I think they do. In fact, I think being a hospitable leader is one of the most important things that leaders can do. And the better care they take of their people, the better care they take of those that they serve that are not their people. So today, I'm just honored to talk to Terry A. Smith. Terry served as the lead pastor for the Life Christian Church, TLCC, for, get this, 27 years. They're a non-denominational faith community in West Orange, New Jersey, serving in the New York City metro area. He's a co-founder of Movement.org, formerly the New York City Leadership Center, and has previously served as an instructor in its Leadership Fellows Program. Terry is passionate about challenging, developing, and encouraging leaders, whether they know their leaders or not. And most leaders don't realize they are. Funny enough. So he holds a Bachelor of Science in Organizational Management and a Master of Arts in Organizational Leadership. He's sharing insights today on how to leverage the power of hospitality to be a more effective leader. And we're going to talk about his book today, The Hospitable Leader. And he's a big Yankees fan and a baseball fan. So we got a lot to talk about today, and I'm really excited. How you doing, Terry? I'm doing great, Phil. It's great to be with you. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks. So, so you're you're a big Yankees fan. So I was just rubbing it in. I got some I got some Yankee Stadium dirt, but you've got you do have one better, man. You've got that autograph Mariano Rivera thing where he signed Sandman. How'd you, how'd you get that? So the Yankees chaplain is a great friend of mine, and he's uh, mentored Mariano for years. And Mariano gave him that gift to give me for my 25th pastoral anniversary a couple years ago. So pretty nice thing to have sitting on my shelf. And I, I, I need to keep the door locked because it's actually worth some money. So, yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool, man. That's pretty cool. So how did you get started being passionate about leadership? I mean, this is not something that most kids wake up and say, you know what? I want to be a leader someday. How does that happen? I think I saw the multiplicative power of leadership. You know, if, if, if you can lead people, uh, you multiply your influence, obviously. And I, I did have tremendous ambition. I wanted to get things done, wanted to make a difference. And I quickly learned that uh, I, I needed to be able to take people with me if I was going to do that. So I started studying leadership, you know, I don't know, three decades ago or more. And uh, I've kind of been enmeshed in that. Not kind of. I've been very enmeshed in that for a long time. Cool. That's really cool, man. So who's, who's the first leader that you remember studying, Terry? Oh, my. You know, uh, probably, boy, that's tough to answer. I think uh, I, John Maxwell comes to mind in terms of someone who, who really started uh, studying the, the discipline of leadership and could inspire around the subject, what, what we're going back 35 years. Uh, but over the years, I mean, I've read, you know, I've read lots and lots of people. And, and, I, and I wouldn't say that at this point that uh, John Maxwell's where I would spend most of my time today, but I'd say he was an early guy for me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Maxwell was one, definitely one of the first people that I read. I remember his work at Skyline Church. Yep. I remember his early stuff, you know, failing forward and the 17 uh, qualities of, of leaders and teamwork and all that stuff. And funny enough, my, uh, my friends know that I'm a big Maxwell fan. So, so some of them are Maxwell certified trainers. So I got an autograph. I have a picture of my friend with John uh, at wow. autographing my book, which is super special to me. So I'm thankful to my friend Becky Spohn for getting that for me. So well, cool. one of his great gifts is he's, he can talk about it in a way that makes it so interesting. So he doesn't just understand it from in, in a perspective of the science of leadership, but he did it. He's done it. Uh, I actually had a Maxwell guy named Brian Dodd uh, speak this past Sunday at our church. Uh, Brian has a huge leadership blog. So, um, yeah, I, I, I was inspired by him many years ago. Cool. That's really cool. So have you read Tom Peters in Search of Excellence? Was on the Absolutely. First, yeah, first Absolutely. Book you have to read that. Again, you, you, the, the, the market's kind of been inundated in, in over, over the years as people have learned more and more of the power of leadership. But some of those early guys, 
um, and gals like, let's say, Frances Hesselbein. I don't know if you're familiar with Frances. Um, she's been a big influence of mine, and she's, she's a big influence on people like Jim Collins, for instance, who writes about her uh, at some length uh, in, in some of the introductions to his books uh, uh, and writes the foreword to her autobiography. Frances was the leader of the Girl Scouts of America for many, many years. And she kind of transformed it into a modern organization. And um, she went, won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And, she, at, and uh, she's become a friend. Uh, she's an endorser on both of my books. Um, and she has powerful leadership theory. She says to lead is to serve. Yeah. And uh, so she's, she's been a big influence of mine as well. Again, we could talk about lots and lots of people, but yeah, there's another name, Jack Welch. Yep. In, in recent years, I think winning, uh, his book with Susie, uh, is uh, maybe, and I, there are other people who say this, maybe the greatest management book ever written. I think if I'm correct, Warren Buffett says that if you read that, you never need to read another management book. Now I, I would say that's hyperbole, but nonetheless, uh, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's, that is a really big deal. That's, that's incredible. And Francis is a 102 years old and still going strong, which is well, fantastic. Well, I was going to tell, you know, I don't know how, how much you want to get into that, but Francis, uh, she's 102 years old and she's still going strong. She spoke at our church just a, a few years ago and, uh, I made the mistake of asking her if she ever had any intention to retire. And, and she said to, to retire is to stop serving and to, and to, to live is to serve. And I, and I'm, I'm never going to stop serving. So uh, yeah, she's quite a dynamic woman. That's fantastic. Wow. That's cool that you've got to spend some time with her. Yeah. Sally, Sally Helgeson is one of my favorite, uh, uh, women uh, leader leadership experts. She wrote a book with uh, Marshall Goldsmith uh, last year about uh, how uh, how women rise. That is wow. Fantastic. I haven't seen that. So I like Marsha Goldsmith a lot, but I'm not familiar with her. Yeah, she's great. So I'll send you a I'll send you a link to her interview. She, I had her on the show uh, last season. So she's she's really fantastic. I really enjoy her stuff. Um, Rosa Say, who wrote Managing with Aloha, is a great management leadership expert. And so is Lisa Hanneberg, who now Lisa's moved into talking about more, um, more, more fiction stuff. Uh, but her, her management book on 10, 10 ways to be a highly effective manager, they just picked it up to reprint it again because wow. it, was, it came out like 12 years ago, one of the best books. And now it's coming out of course with a bright orange cover. So now I love it even more. <laughs> so it works out pretty well. Well, you, you, you're, you're naming a lot of names that are kind of beyond what I've been reading in recent years. So it's great to hear those names. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people, you know, th to that point uh, that, that you talk about in, in the intro, a lot of times people don't even realize they lead and yet they're really great leaders. So why do you think that is, Terry? Why don't people realize what kind of influence they really have? Well, I think, first of all, you know, there's this whole thing about our leaders born or made. Uh, I think there's an understanding that there's just a small percentage of people who actually have uh, what's frequently called a leadership gift, a natural leadership inclination. And so I think the, a lot of people don't self-identify as leaders, but the fact is everybody's a leader somewhere or should be. So when I talk about leadership, I try to talk to CEOs and I try to talk to moms. In fact, it could be argued the most important leaders in our society are moms. And so if you can learn to lead in the family rather than dictate in the family, for instance, uh, if, you, if, you can, if you can develop leadership skills in any context, well, you can be successful. So one of the things we try to do in our congregation is to get everybody to be intentional about leading something. Go, go lead something because your life has multiple, has multiplied impact when you're leading something, go lead a little league team, go lead a boy scout troop, lead a Sunday school class, uh, at your, at your job, make sure that you're always involved in the leadership track, because if it's just you, it's just you. But if you can learn to lead other people, you have, you have power and you can use that power for good. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's, that's really important. The more, the sooner I think we learn to lead and realize that it's not about us, that it's really about those we serve. It, it really makes a big difference because some of the early leaders that I saw in my career were very self-centered. They, they thought leadership was all about them instead of all about the people that they served. And, and once I realized that once, you know, <clears throat> once I took that to heart, and I started, you know, I, I finally got a title to lead instead of being an untitled leader. I got to help change some of that. But, you know, I fought that as well. I, I thought, <clears throat> you know, the, the speed, be, understanding that the speed of the team is the speed of the leader, I often felt that that meant the harder that I worked, the harder I needed to ride my team and, and go them into working. And frankly, that's just, that's messed up. Yeah, I think one of the beautiful things that's happened over the last couple of decades is, uh, you know, uh, influences like Robert Greenleaf and and servant leadership, obviously, but but even some of the exploration around what people call soft leadership qualities, that really, as as they're studied more and more, there's an awareness that they really bring hard results, and um, so I I I really appreciate a, a lot of the work that's been done. Uh, you, you know, you see it manifest in stuff like, let's say, Seth Godin, uh, who I, I I believe you've interviewed, if I'm correct. I have, uh, yep. So you you contrast, although I I don't I don't think the contrast is really fair, but you contrast. Um, well, let's just say some of the leadership styles of the baby boomers, um, going back 25 years ago, where a, a leader had positional power, exercised authority, oft times harshly. Uh, it was all about results. And, um, and uh, they often used people, uh, abused people to get where they were going. I mean, it, it wasn't, I don't think anybody's fault. I just think it was a misunderstanding of leadership. And there's been a sea change. So one of the, one of the key ideas, by the way, it, just in case we don't get back to this, in my new book, The Hospitable Leader, is, is uh, I have five welcomes in the book, and one of the welcomes is called Dreams. This is where I talk about how, how hospitable leaders are hospitable to people and their dreams. There are a lot of organizations, to speak to what you just said, where you get this sense that the organization exists and the people in the organization exist to see the leader's dreams come true, or the organization's mission be fulfilled. I am promoting a leadership that says that a leader should get up every day and they should try to make their followers dreams come true and be fully invested in the success of the people who follow them. I offer this definition of lead, of moral leadership, pardon my long uh, uh, peroration here, Phil, but um, I, I offer a definition of moral leadership where I say uh, that moral leaders inspire, influence, and empower others to self-actualization and the accomplishment of mission. Now, the first part of that, for anybody who studies leadership, everyone knows exactly what that means. Leaders inspire, influence, and empower. And I could write a book about each of those things, but it's not necessary. Everybody gets that stuff. But, but I say that moral leaders inspire, influence, and empower people to self-actualization and the accomplishment, accomplishment of mission. In other words, the leader is concerned about the self-actualization of the follower at the same time that they're concerned about accomplishing the mission of the organization. And I believe it's a both and proposition that both things can be done. And when you focus on the self-actualization of the follower, or as I call it in this new book, the dreams of the follower, well, then it's much more likely that organizational mission actually gets fulfilled. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So, so let's talk definition here, as you, you mentioned that uh, dreams and other things. So what is it, when you talk about the hospitable leader, Terry, what does hospitable mean to you as you define it? Well, when I talk about hospitable leader, here, here's the technical definition of a hospitable leader. A hospitable leader creates environments of welcome where moral leadership can more effectively influence an ever-expanding diversity of people. So a hospitable leader 
is concerned, it, it's really a precursor to every other form of leadership practice. Because a hospitable leader is trying to create an environment where they can more effectively influence, and to me this is real important, an ever-expanding diversity of people. So I'm concerned about creating an environment of welcome. When I talk about an environment of welcome, I'm talking about physical environment, spiritual environment, attitudinal environment, emotional environment, and communicative environment. So I'm talking about looking at environment in a multi-layered way so that, so that I can get people in a place where they can more easily be influenced to good and beautiful things. Awesome. I think that's where a lot of people would want to be. I mean, that sounds like a place that is open, is encouraging, is a place where, where we can thrive or a place where, you know, our gifts come to their fullest fruition instead of a place where, well, no, 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 you just go off in the corner and just do that one little thing and, and that'll be enough. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to create a place. Um, there, there, a guy named Ken Gosnell wrote a blog, uh, and, and in it, he said, I hope to meet Ken someday. I've not, I'm, I'm not really aware of any of his other work, but I happen to see this blog that got me thinking several years ago. And this is just one aspect of this whole concept. But he said that, a, that an employer should treat employees like guests in their home. And I love that idea, uh, and I think it's transformative of treating one's employees, for instance, and again, we could talk about this in a lot of ways, as guests in one home, uh, in, in one's home. You know, a lot of times we talk about treat, or we always have talked here about treating our employees as family, but the fact is that a lot of times we don't pay attention to family because family is familiar. And so we're accustomed to each other and, and we're not showing any particular hospitality. But when you're treating an employee as a guest, you're, you're, you're prepared for them. You, you, you're, you make sure things are ready when they get there. You're attentive to their needs. You're asking them how they're doing. You're trying to figure out ways to serve them. You're trying to create an experience that's meaningful for them. So that would be an, a, an application of this idea of hospitable leadership. Excellent. So what are some of those, what are some of the obstacles, Terry, that get in the way of doing this? Because this seems, you know, the more you say it, the more it sounds like common sense to me, the more it sounds like something, well, of course we should do this. It's so obvious. Why doesn't everybody? So why doesn't everybody? Uh, I think that's uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think uh, it takes a lot of energy to think about this. Again, let's just talk about uh, the perspective of an employer. So I don't have a huge uh, staff, but, but we have about 30 people on our staff. And um, it takes a lot of time and energy to think about how to develop human resource policies that really serve both the individual and the organization at the same time. In fact, we're in a, because I've gotten convicted by my own book, we're in a total rethink of our human resource policies where um, we're, we're just think, just asking the question, how do we create the absolute best environment in the world for our people to work in? And at the same time, do it in a way, and this is real important, leadership's about getting people from here to there, right? It's not about creating an environment where you're sitting around singing kumbaya all the time, and making everybody feel good about everything. You got to get things done. You do have to accomplish the mission. But 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 I think that you can create an environment that's so welcoming and then stimulating where you can influence people in ways that mission gets accomplished. What keeps us from it? Well, let's say a few weeks ago, uh, a member of my congregation who's a top-level executive at Facebook, um, this this guy's boss reports to Mark Zuckerberg. So that's how far up this guy is in Facebook. Uh, and, and he's leading a project that literally will transform the world if successful. And I'm not going to get too much into all of that, except to say that he had me for dinner and took me on a tour of Facebook, uh, their headquarters in New York City. And though I've done a lot of reading about the more innovative organizations, uh, it was still really great to see it up front and personal. 
and, and to see the ways that they, the investment that they make in creating an environment for their people, a physical environment. And I, 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 there's some controversy right now about some other things, but a physical environment for their people, like no one ever has to leave to go get anything to eat because, you know, it's free, high-class food in, in a variety of places. Anyway, well, when you now apply that kind of a principle to a relatively small business, like, again, I have 30 employees, we're actually trying to think about, okay, is it possible for us to make that kind of investment in our environment? Again, it's just one thing, but it's the kind of questions that a leader starts asking, and it also answers your question that I spent five minutes poorly answering. What keeps organizations from doing this? It's so obvious. Wow. Wow. Well, that's, it is a lot of work. And, and I, I, for sure, I mean, it, but it's the good work. I mean, it's the work that really is lasting. I, I would, I might say that the reason people don't do it is because they don't think they're going to be in their job in a couple of years. And Ooh. therefore that investment might not actually pay off. Ooh. Like, right. If I was going to invest in you for five years and I was only going to be around for two of that, you know, we see that with coaches all the time, right? That's why they pick up that, that free agent. If you're, you know, whatever sport it is, they pick up that free agent that might help them get over the hump realizing that if they don't, they're probably going to get fired. So why not take the chance? Yeah. But, you know, I, I think this, this speaks to the whole idea of moral leadership, which is to say that if I really care about you and your dreams, then I understand there's a possibility, well, that no, no one is going to be with me forever. Um, now, I have a son who works for me now, uh, works with me now, Perhaps he will actually outlast me here. But I realize that in most cases, no one's going to work with me forever. And so I have to be investing in more than what they can bring me in a particular uh, year or a particular season. I have to be investing in them because I really care about their self-actualization, them becoming everything God destined them to become. And then I've got to hold that loosely and uh, let that process play out regardless how it serves what I'm doing. I have to see that as part of my mission, as part of what, what success is for me. Yeah. Well, and having that legacy mindset, understanding that it's beyond you, not just here in the now or even here in five years, but here forever. And even after we're gone, leaders, you know, eventually will all be gone. And eventually, you know, all we'll have is our legacy. All we'll have is, is the things that we imparted. And hopefully, you know, we'll, that'll continue on and, and, and people will continue to, to Im be impacted by the things we said. But sometimes <clears throat> I think that doesn't happen. I think sometimes, you know, we forget, we move on and we think, oh, well, that doesn't matter, right? I don't want to do it that way because, the, well, the last leader did it that way. Instead of, boy, I'd like to continue that legacy on and, and help that live forward in a, in a different way. So when we talk about leadership, though, so who are, who are some great leaders that, that you've seen uh, model this? Um, may, hopefully, maybe some that we've, that we've heard of and maybe some that we haven't. I think um, a couple business examples come to mind. Um, one would be Ed Catmull at... Uh, at Pixar. Have you ever read his book, Creativity Inc.? I've not. It actually is a fantastic leadership book. And it's amazing the way Ed, who I think is more uh, inclined to hospitality, perhaps in his just basic makeup, it's amazing the way he merged with the brilliance of Steve Jobs and Apple and um, the, the way that they created an environment where maximum creativity could be lived out by their team and the work that they do is just brilliant. And it's everything from physical space, which actually Steve Jobs had a whole lot to do with the creation of the headquarters of Pixar, which is brilliant from everything I've read and seen. I've not actually been there, 
um, in terms of, of creating space for community and for people to run e into each other in ways where conversations would happen. Uh, you, there has actually been studies that some of the greatest breakthrough ideas come actually not in a meeting, but when people are, 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 are standing and talking somewhere in, in the office space and just having a conversation across disciplines a lot of times. Anyway, Ed Catmull and, and his book, Creativity, Inc., would be a great example of what I would call hospitable leadership. Um, I, think, um, I think Howard Schultz and Starbucks, actually. Again, I, I bring up some things that there's, there's some controversy around it because uh, corporate culture can tend to destroy even the, the, the spirit of, of a leader. But uh, have you ever read Howard Schultz's book, Onward? Yep. It's a great book. I think it's a great book on leadership. So that's a, that's a great example of emerging of hospitality and leadership because he's, he's telling baristas, for instance, not just to serve a cup of coffee, but to create an experience for people. And everything about the way a Starbucks is designed is for people to come and to want to be in that third space as it's, it's as it's often been called we'll see what what i'm proposing what in this in this in this merge of hospitality and leadership then is that we we create environments where people feel whatever it is they feel in spaces like that but we create environments like that so we can lead people so we can influence people and um so that would be another example. Uh, a nonprofit I would think about actually would be Craig Groeschel's church called uh, Life Church TV. If, if you listen to Craig talk uh, about organizational culture, uh, they do some things. Another thing that we're exploring right now is they give their team unlimited time off. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I thought when I first heard it. That's interesting. And, and the more that I've thought about it, the more interested I've become in this idea that you manage the 90% of your people who are what Scott McGregor, the leadership theoretician called theory X people, people who they're creative. They, they want to do well. They they're excited about work, et cetera. Um, you manage your organization according to the 90% and therefore you're what's called McGregor calls a theory X manager uh, as opposed to being a theory Y manager, which manages people believing that they have to be directed, dictated to managed closely, really controlled. And it all has to do with the way you think about people. And um, so I kind of, we're actually exploring the idea my, my staff and tire doesn't know this, but I'm thinking about this unlimited time off thing where you give people guidelines, but you trust them to make good decisions. I, I just think about how empowering, how hospitable that is to people. So um, th th those are a couple uh, organizations that come to mind when I think, by the way, in the preface of my book, The Hospitable Leader, I talk about um, how the hospitable leadership describes something that is happening uh, in more and more leadership contexts. It's something that you see happening. And I'm giving a name to kind of a leadership zeitgeist that's going on, I hope. And I don't want to be too presumptuous about that. But at the same time that's happening, there's another kind of leadership that's happening just as much on the other end of the spectrum which has created or helped to create this terrible polarization that we have in every area of our culture. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm celebrating a certain kind of leadership. And at the same time, I'm hoping to uh, resist an inhospitable leadership that's everything but welcoming and that won't allow us to sit down with people who aren't like us and have a conversation that could be constructive and make a positive difference. Hmm. So, so one of the things maybe then, that if we're thinking about how we would get started being a more hospitable leader, could be just being more welcoming and inviting people in or accepting an invitation from them to go to their home or their favorite place and to spend time with them, maybe in, you know, in community, in community with 
with them to understand who, have, who, who they are and what makes them tick? Is, am I hearing that right? Or did I hear that yeah. wrong? Yeah, so so uh, in, in part, you're definitely hearing it right. It, it's a slice of the bigger idea. So, so I mentioned a few minutes ago that I've organized the hospitable leader around five welcomes. And it, it, t- give me just a second to get to that specific thing. The first welcome is called home. That's where I kind of, I, I, I state the obvious, but dig in deep. And that's this idea that, that, a, that a hospitable leader creates environments that touches the need in people to feel home. We want people to, to feel at home in, in our leadership sphere. Uh, and I, I say that home is where the heart is warm. And when someone's heart is warm, you can more easily influence them. And we pay attention to, to, to the discipline of warming people's hearts. I've been surrounded, I'm I'm here in the New York City area, and um, I'm just surrounded by wonderful leaders with Ivy League MBAs, Uh, and I've just been amazed how often uh, these folks will lead a thing without having learned any soft leadership skills. And it's just the facts, ma'am, Joe Friday leadership. It's, it's all about the in, information conveyed and, and making sure you're, you're walking out of a meeting or, uh, with your objectives uh, intact and timelined and, and so on and so forth. But a good leader knows if someone's just walking out of a meeting with an action item list, but their heart isn't warm, if they're not, if, then their will isn't engaged. And to get an action item list completed, somebody's will has to be engaged. A good leader knows how to do what one of our values here at the Life Christian Church for our staff team is we massage people's hearts. Wow. We're, we're, we, so so, so the, the person serving coffee at the coffee bar isn't just serving a cup of coffee. They're, they're imagining reaching into the chest of that person and massaging their heart. They're, they're trying to warm people's hearts. And at every level of leadership, we're always thinking about that. We're always trying to touch that part of a person that feels home, that feels that welcome where their heart is warm, and then we can influence them. The second welcome, which now actually gets to the question that you asked, is maybe the most important part of the book. Um, it's called Strangers. And this is where I talk about how that ho- a big part of hospitable leadership is learning to love the stranger. There's this, uh, now I'm a pastor, so here comes, here comes scripture. There's this great passage of scripture in Hebrews 13, 1, that says, um, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Um, the Greek there, and, and now you're saying, I can't believe this guy's going to mention a Greek word. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> the Greek word is there is Philadelphia. And I'm not, uh, it, it, he says, keep on practicing Philadelphia. And I'm not talking about Philadelphia in the sense of the, 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 the team that just signed Bryce Harper to an incredible contract. He, he, I'm talking about brotherly love. So Hebrews 13.1, he says, keep on practicing Philadelphia. But then Hebrews 13.2 says, and don't forget to be hospitable to strangers. And by so doing, you may be entertaining an angel unaware. And the Greek word there is philoxenia, which means to love a stranger or to entertain a stranger or to be hospitable to a stranger. And one of the things I teach is that, that it's hard enough for us to practice Philadelphia, to love each other as brothers and sisters. But it's a whole other dimension when we move from Philadelphia to Philoxenia, when we create space to love a stranger, believing that that stranger may be an angel that we're entertaining unaware or a messenger from God. And so I spent a lot of time talking about what it means to create an environment that is so welcoming, where you love people who are strange to you and to whom you are strange. And that, I believe, is a game changer societally. It's a game changer for businesses, organizations, churches, neighborhoods. If we can learn not just to love people who are like us, but we create some place that welcomes people 
who are not like us. And what I've learned, and, and so part of what you may not know about me, is this church I lead in a suburb of New York City has been called by some people the most diverse church in the world. So we're diverse in about every way you can imagine. And so racially, ethnically, nation of origin, but we're diverse socioeconomically. We're diverse in terms of lots of PhDs and and people who are trying to earn their GEDs. Uh, We're diverse, uh, our leadership, uh, it's men and women. It's, uh, it's, It's just diverse in every way, older people, younger people, and we do not have a dominant racial group in our church. This is almost unheard of. A lot of times churches will be diverse if 20% of the uh, population of the church is different than the senior leader and whatever the dominant uh, racial or ethnicity uh, may be. So the, so what I've learned is that, that for, we have created an environment here in our church that welcomes all kinds of people who are completely different from each other, and who want to do life together. I'm going to guess half of us are Democrats and half of us are Republicans. Well, maybe a third, a third, and a third independence. So how do, you cre- how do you create an environment where people want to do a small group discussion where the other people in the room are people who are totally other than them? This doesn't happen. This doesn't happen in our culture. People choose to home to them is hanging out with people who are pretty much just like they are, where you can talk about your political views and everybody's sitting around saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what is it like to be in an environment where if you shared your political views, the other person would be, you know, deeply offended? Wow. That's pretty cool, man. That sounds like a great place to be. So how... I got to tell you, Terry, so out of all the stuff you said, first, the meaning of Philoxenia makes me smile big time because I'm going to say my name, you know, obviously my name is Phil growing up, right? Philip meant lover of horses, but I'm going to take that the root of my name is Philoxenia instead, because (laughs) I think I like that a whole lot better. That's the first thing you said that it really resonated with. And then finally, finally, yeah, finally, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) And then how do we, you know, how do we love people that are just completely different from us and feel like at home and feel comfortable with that? And that's, man, that, that's time. That's recency. And that's exactly, I would argue, that's exactly what the country needs right now is a whole lot more philoxenia and a whole lot less xenophobia, right? And, and, and you, you, you nailed it. Philoxenia is the opposite of xenophobia. And we have a problem in our country of not loving the stranger. Now, don't misunderstand me. That's not an immigration statement. You know, we could talk about it in that context. That's not what I mean. I mean, whoever an individual is in our country right now, they seem to have, we seem to have a problem loving the person, loving the person who is not like us. I'm not talking about tolerating. That is a low standard. I'm talking about love. And that's a whole other thing. And so what would it be like to watch a congressional hearing where there was a sense that people on either side of the aisle loved the person who is strange to them. And so this is where in in hospitable leadership, I see the table as a metaphor for really everything. And it's the idea that we, we, we invite people to the table from every imaginable background and we learn to speak truth to each other. I'm, again, I'm not interested in singing Kumbaya. I'm interested in leadership. I'm interested in influence. Well, I want to influence people, and I, and I, have, I have a message that I want to share. But, but if, 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 if people are not at the table who need to hear it, what, what kind of leadership is that? Yeah, that's an echo chamber, man. That's not leadership. Yeah. That's just talking to people that sing the same song you do and know the same music you do. And that, that's not real influence. I mean, to, to lead the converted doesn't no. take much effort. People no. that are already going in that direction, you just got to keep going. That's not real leadership, right? To love those that are different from us, that have different opinions of us, that, that are not, maybe they don't love us first. 
even that, that's, that, takes some, that takes some work. That takes some effort. I would say that, that takes a pretty hospitable leader, huh, Terry? Yeah. I, I, uh, I want to be careful about how I say this, but I, I had a nice conversation a few weeks ago with uh, one of the leading presidential candidates in the next election cycle. Somebody who's been a friend of mine for years endorsed uh, my first book. And um, I, <laughs> I had a conversation with him about hospitable leadership. And I said, in essence, I said, y- you know, you are talking about things in a way where people who disagree with you will not listen. They will not listen. And, and the fact is, I know you as a good man, even though I disagree with you a lot of things, and the you I've known before you stepped on the national stage, you would have asked people to sit down and discuss differences. And now you're yelling about them. And we need somebody in this country who, who will at least allow us to, to – We'll love each other enough to at least be able to discuss our differences in a way. And so you're never, you, 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 you're positioning yourself in a way where people who disagree with you are never going to change their minds. And frankly, I think that that kind of discussion needs to be happening all, all over the country, both sides of the aisle, um, denominations arguing with each other um, in, 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 every, in, every, in every circumstance. Absolutely. We could all do from a little with a little more philoxenia and a lot more being a hospitable leader. So Terry, if people want to get to know you more, if they want to connect with you, I mean, I, I got to tell you, buddy, this has been an amazingly fast interview and an awesome conversation. I know I want to connect with you more. So how do, how do people get connected with you more? Well, thanks for asking me that. And of course, I'm prepared to share that. So, um, we, we've opened a special page on our website for your listeners. And um, uh, if, if they go to that website, they can get a free preview of the book and they can buy the audio book at a 50% discount at this only at, at your page. So the website is Terry a Smith dot com. My name is spelled T E R R Y Terry a Smith dot com forward slash Phil. We should have said Phil Xenia, but we, I, we hadn't had the conversation yet. TerryASmith.com forward slash Phil. And um, so, you know, and they can see a bunch of stuff uh, on my website, TerryASmith.com. But that, that page is for your listeners to get a discount and, and learn more about how to connect with me. Awesome. Really, really good stuff. So folks, the book is The Hospitable Leader. This was Terry A. Smith. Check out terryasmith.com slash Phil. Get to know Terry more. Learn from him. And please, friends, practice the true meaning of philoxenia. Love each other, even if you're completely different. And I would say, especially if you're completely different. So thanks so much for being here, for spending a little time with us. Have a great day. And thank you so much, Terry. This was fun, man. Thanks, Phil. Thanks a lot. My pleasure.